Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. I first want to thank the Central Vermont Career Center for hosting us and everyone for coming by to see the great work done by these CTE students who are up there watching us at this point in time. Repairing a mobile home damaged by last summer's flood. Now, as many of you know, I've been in the shoes and boots of many of the students here today. And I got my start uh, in, uh, in the trades here in Spalding. After graduating, I went to UVM to become a CTE instructor. But after receiving my certification to teach, decided to go into business instead. I spent 35 years in the construction industry. And I've seen for myself the need for workers with the kind of skills that you're learning right now. I've also seen a positive change in the stigma surrounding CTE. I want to thank teachers and administrators for their help because these are great careers and we desperately need more in the trades. And as our workforce gets older, we'll continue to need more skilled trades workers in Vermont. Last summer, a number of mobile home parks across Vermont were devastated by the floods, resulting in several mobile homes being condemned. We saw the need to help those families who not only lost everything, but weren't getting the maximum FEMA of benefit. And we were responsible for getting their homes removed from the lots. So we brought together a team from a number of different agencies to make sure no one in these parks had to worry about or pay for their home to be removed or deconstructed. And we provided state money to get them up to their full FEMA amount. In total, we distributed $670,000 31 homeowners. We also found a few homes were salvageable and could be repaired and used again. So we reached out to CTE centers to see if they'd be able to or interested in renovating these units as part of their training. I saw this as a real opportunity for students to get creative with their design and get some hands on experience to help them build the skills needed to work in the trades after high school. Things like restoring the interior and exterior, moving windows or doors around, weatherizing, and replacing the wiring and plumbing to bring it up to code, which is skills many of you here today have been building on all year long and will use in your careers to come. Importantly, <laughs> this work will add to the number of homes available for Vermonters helping with our housing shortage. Once these units are complete, they'll leave the CTE centers as a healthy home for someone to live in, in much better shape than when they arrived. And while this is just one small piece of a bigger strategy my team is working on, it's important because mobile homes are a way to quickly and more affordably bring homes online faster. So to the CTE students here today, whether you're about to graduate or you'll be back next year, I hope you've learned a lot from this and more than just the day-to-day -day work on the home itself, but the feeling that comes along with seeing a project through from start to finish or almost finish. And knowing the work you've done here will benefit your community. And it doesn't have to stop here. Whether it's helping out an elderly neighbor or sprucing up a park or playground, there are opportunities all around us to get involved and leave our communities better than we found. So with that, we're over to CBCC's director, Jody Emerson. Jody. We accepted the challenge and received a grant that was required to be spent almost immediately, mobile home site unseen, so that we could gather supplies and tools for the work. It was certainly difficult guessing, but our students and instructors jumped right in, pulled together a list and placed their orders. The supplies arrived and we waited. We visited a few in the fall, October and December, and then the mobile home you see here was delivered January 3rd. We applied for permits soon after. Students in our exploratory program completed the majority of the demolition, demolition starting in January and working through February. 
Governor Scott, you were here on January 29th and spoke with students about the project. Students and staff worked together to redesign the floor plan to ensure two bedrooms and two bathrooms in this mobile home. And once the permits arrived, the building trades, electrical and plumbing and heating students collaborated on the renovation. There were also several businesses who supported this work, especially the HV. While not yet completed, students were able to get to work in the mobile home in late March through April and May and have completed as much as they can this school year. It was great seeing the changes from across the parking lot throughout the spring and stopping by on occasion for a closer look. Our students are done here this week and we'll be celebrating them tomorrow night and we will be selling the mobile home as is via auction which will open today and close on July 15th at 2 p.m. We hope to recoup the gear grant provided by the state and perhaps some of the additional costs of the project with CBCC and COBRA. The following students will now take a moment to share what they and their peers were able to do. We'll hear from Ronan Kelly from Building Trades, Owen Cheney and Kyle Fleury from Plumbing and Heating, and Ethan Garrison from Electrical Technology. Hi, I'm Ronan Kelly. Uh, so, Building Trades. Uh, a couple of the things that I kind of took for this project to work was, um, I'm already not reading off my script. Um, so there was a couple things that really helped us learn a lot more with this project than if we just did our like in-shop building. So mobile homes often require uh, various construction and renovation tasks, including, um, you know, we had to repair a lot of rotten floor joists and framework on the trailer. Um, we replaced the subfloor completely and we redid the roofing on it. Um, and then we also painted the new siding that's on it. Um, so it gave us a diverse range of um, tasks we had to complete to get this done. Um, unlike shop related tasks of us building, uh, because that we build it throughout the year and then we take it down at the end. This is something that we um, work on and then we have a mostly completed project that we know is gonna last a lot longer than just one year. Um, this project's a bit more cost effective than us building a complete structure outright and then selling it because we already have a lot of the work, a lot of the work's already done so we're just fixing it. This has a bigger community impact than just um, putting more people into the workforce because it's giving us something that we can actually put out into the community. So it's gonna help with um, the affordable housing. So we partnered with a lot of other companies uh, like Efficiency Vermont because they came out and told us basically how we can make it a bit more energy efficient for this. And so this mobile home project offered a lot of skills for us to learn that'll help us with our um, future careers in construction. And that's all I have. Um, my name is Ethan Garrison. I'm from the electrical program. I'm just kind of like focusing a bit more on just what the electrical program did in all this. Um, as said, we were uh, tasked with uh, rehabbing this trailer with the idea that someone would be buying and making this a home. Um, so we all agreed to have like the highest standard for work and uh, everything that we do, highest standard. Uh, <laughs> The opportunity started with us filing an uh, electrical permit through the Barry City and then making the electrical plans um, for it that follow all of the code um, in the NEC National Electrical Code Book. Um, after filing the permit, we got started in the rough in phase of the electrical work. Um, we completed all of the basic circuits that are required in a home that you need for basic living. Um, after this, we got in contact with the Barry City electrical inspector. He came down and inspected um, the mobile home and informed us that anything we actually needed to do, which we didn't let to do much. Um, a little bit of tweaking, and then we got approval to cover all the walls 
and um, start the trim out phase, which includes putting in all the devices and the lights and all that. Um, I really enjoyed this opportunity and believe my classmates and I were able to use this uh, real, this real uh, world education experience. And I think we'll take the knowledge that we learned uh, in the first part of the year, put it into this, and apply it on a practical level. My name is Kyle Flurry, I'm one of the students from Columbia Community. We got a bit of a late start on the project because of some classwork stuff, but once we got out here, it definitely showed us that we could have something used as a real life experience for getting out in the workforce. We did a lot of the venting for all the sewage, for all the drainage, we had all the venting down to the walls and everything. Um, since our late start kind of pushed us back, we didn't get the drainage underneath the structure done. But all the water lines are ready for pictures and future pictures. And our tub is the showers. We're all set in place. Um, hi, my name is Owen Cheney. Uh, I'm in the plumbing engineering program. I took lead on installing the boiler. We chose to do an NTI TRX150C as our boiler which the C stands for combination, and that runs our hydronic heating system, which will most likely be baseboard or whatever the owner chooses. And it also does your domestic hot water, which is your hot water to all your fixtures. We got the boiler up on the wall, and we built our manifold, and got that all done. And that's about as far as we got before the end. Questions. Yeah, for any of the students, um, were there any surprises you encountered with this project timeline given that this was a very less damaged trailer? What was different about it maybe than what you've done in shop? I think they've, uh, that it's an older kind of house that we're not used to because we're used to working with all the newer equipment. So being able to start something from an older project and tear it all down and build it back up with newer stuff and upgrade it and design it how we'd like, it's kind of cool. We feel like retrofitted. Uh, we also had the one working on like the floor joists for the flooring. Uh, we actually had to pull out a lot of the rim joists, which you would typically have framed out, and then you put all the floor joists in that. But we would have to, we had to rip out rim joists to replace it with new pieces of wood. So that was kind of a different way of fixing it. Uh, yeah, just kind of seeing how existing um, projects can get uh, damaged by water kind of gave us a bigger uh, idea of how we can help waterproof certain things, you know, add. Uh, I had like this, I don't know exactly what it's called, like this paste stuff that helps waterproof our electrical stuff. I think with rust. Uh, it was definitely a different experience from all our shop work because everything we do in the shop is new built and we don't have any unexpected surprises come up with mold that was hidden behind drywall and other hidden objects before we start taking into the project. So that's definitely something different we don't bring up. When, when is this uh, this home going to be ready, and, and how do we determine who's going to, to live in it? Is this going to be carved aside for flood survivors, or how, how does that process work? Uh, we're using a typical auction process like we would have with the double whites that this center used to make. Um, it's going to be sold as is, so it's not going to be completed beyond what you're seeing here today. Unless, of course, my staff wants to rally in PD next week and finish it up, which is also possible. Um, so we are opening that today, and we will close it at 2 p.m. on July 15th and select the winning bid. And if that works out, great. If not, it goes to the next person and so on and so forth. Are, uh, are any of you guys seniors? And, and if so, you got, got any plans yet for what you're going to be doing next year? So that's me. Uh, so I'm a senior at Spalding High School. Um, I took part in Spalding's JRTC program, and in uh, early July, I'm going to be shipping out to the Navy to do uh, their nuclear engineering program. Where was this home located when it flooded last year? This is uh, 
think this one came from River Run. Okay. This one came from Johnson, actually. Well, this is a Johnson. This is a Johnson. Sorry about that. Okay. And if, do we know how many homes that were flooded last year have been rehabbed through this program? We have, let's see, two, two I believe, at uh, River Bend in Bradford. We have one here. We have one up in Amosburg. That's about it for now. And what kind of state was this home in when it came to you and what kind of work you know did you need to do to make it safe for people to live in again? I, I got I got uh, uh, we, we looked at it before. So uh, our class came in uh, before the exploratory program came in and started the demolition. And there were many holes in the floor. There was a lot of visible like rot on it. And there was um, like the door that's right here. There was almost no wood underneath it. So it was a very precarious situation for that door. So that was where a lot of the big stuff we had to replace was. So it was pretty bad. This one was as this was mentioned, it was flooded in Johnson, and the homeowner had been taken up part of the floor and trying to dry it out and so forth. And had done a, a lot of that work, and it's the uh, starting of the demolition. So then he stopped and uh, got uh, tied up with life, and, and I wasn't able to continue. He was living in a tent outside the mobile home for a number of months. Many of these mobile home parks <clears throat> that were, were flooded out go there today. There's still some trailers there, others like River Run are completely wiped out, gone, taken away. I mean, are, is the state allowing people to still build or, or people to put homes on these properties? Yeah, I think it's, it's more on the local level. Uh, for instance, in Berlin, they determine the administrator of the, 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 the town government decide whether they can move back in or not. Um, there are a number of, uh, like in Johnson, they've elevated uh, a number of the homes. Um, so after Irene, they have elevated a number, like a couple of feet, and uh, these were in a different section, and they're elevating these as well when they put them back in. So it's different for, for different, uh, different governments. Also, this session, Governor, as, as you know, not every CTD center has the capacity for a program like this. There was a bill that took a look at the governance and funding structures of CTD to try to uh, make it more, more equitable statewide. Do you know where, where that bill landed and, and what effect that, that could have for, for opportunities like this for students? Well, I first want to say that uh, we hope that this program will continue. Uh, we provide the seed money for the CTE centers to buy the materials and so forth, and then they can do what they want with it. We hope that they're going to put it back into the program because they're, as you move across the state, there are a number of mobile homes and parts uh, that are dilapidated and need to be renovated. And uh, what better, uh, you know, what better project than this to teach about real life? And what better way to than to be able to bring the mobile home right to your CTE center rather than traveling by bus. That's what they said in Enosburg. They've done other projects throughout the, the county, but they spend an hour or two just taking a bus um, and going to the location in the back. Putting it in the parking lot allows them that access. And, uh, and again, a number of different disciplines. So that's still plumbing to, to some other rough carpentry, finished carpentry, and so forth. So it teaches you all facets of, uh, of uh, renovation and uh, construction. So that's the good news. In terms of, there were some CTE centers that were interested in the program. They just didn't line up. They'd already had them, right? They had them or already had some manufactured homes that they were obligated to finish. So they didn't have an opportunity to do that. But I think in the future, uh, there's, uh, again, a lot of opportunity to, to build out this program, to bring some of these uh, mobile homes in uh, that are in desperate need, and then put them into good use. Do you know anything about the CPE bill of the past? Anything, any update on that? We're working with the consultant. 
nothing on the CD and of course you did not pass. Or did or did not? It did, did not. not. Or did not. Yeah. I know you've got a meeting this week, Governor, with uh, legislative leaders to discuss uh, education finance proposals, alternatives to the yield bill. Um, following that meeting, will you be sharing with the public your proposal? Are there any details you can share now? Um, I don't want to get ahead of it. The, it's, uh, the meeting uh, will be held in the next day or so, um, but we hope to share that with you. Whatever we have, we want to share. We would like to give them an opportunity to see it first. Just for it's, it's, that are worried about this issue of some broad contours of what's going on. It's not going to be much different than what we presented. There may, may be a few more ideas. Uh, you know, there's been some upgrades in our revenue forecast, more money coming in. So we want to uh, provide, again, an option, a menu of options uh, that uh, could reduce the rates. Can, just can you remind folks, uh, sort of just in plain language, what was that proposal that you put forward to lawmakers in April? Um, Doug, do you, do you remember any of that? Any, anybody here remember all the details that were passed in April? It would be better coming from Craig yeah. because uh, our commissioner of tax presented that. Super high level, but conceptually, what do you have in mind? It must have been in the room. I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, though. I, you know, you're the governor. This is your plan. How would you explain to the monitor what it is we well, want yeah, to do? There are a number of different initiatives that we think we can buy down some of the rates. That's part of it. Uh, we can utilize uh, some of what they've done uh, to get them down into something reasonable. I mean, I, I don't think an 18% increase is reasonable. I don't think 14% is reasonable. I think the average everyday Vermonters, uh, when they get their property tax bills in July or August, are going to be shocked at the increase. So I think we have to do everything we can to bring that down a little bit further. Again, we'll have, we have a number of things that we presented over, over the last session, as well as uh, previous to that, and some new ideas as well. But I, I'd like to wait until we present that to the legislature. Then you'll see it for yourself. As you said, this is a proposal that you did present to the legislature. You said Partial. it won't, it won't be, said, won't be like any changes. To some it. of it. Yeah. Some will be changed. So, so the, deferment, the deferment uh, portion will not be on it. Um, we're not going to on that at this point. Can you explain what the deferment option was? That was like a loan uh, to the school districts over a five year period that will pay that back to buy down the piece. So, again, very high level, what, what would be the mechanism by which you buy down the surplus? You know, we're using surplus money now. The legislature had, had some taxes that they included. They, uh, that was staying included. Uh, Maybe some things like that. But there's some other provisions as well. 13.4% average right now, statewide. What would your proposal be like? Uh, I'd like to see it get down to 4 or 5%. Your plan will achieve if you took it all. Sure. And you said the deferment will not be offered. Yeah. Not offered. Okay. Do you know how? But, but I wanted to. I do want to clarify something here. I mean, I know there was a lot of concern um, from the treasurer, and, and from and I appreciate the concern. But we did meet with bonding companies, the rating agencies. Um, they did. They did. Uh, provide their rating uh, with their rating and what we were contemplating that uh, they went ahead and gave us a rating in which is a, and they've already gone out for, for bonds which are giving us uh, a pretty good rate on that. They did include in some of their language, at least one the standard core, I believe, um, that said they're very concerned about the structural issues within the education plan. Um, so they continue to want us to work on the structural aspect of the, uh, of the education plan. And um, do you know, like, just just how uh, ahead of forecast are the revenues? Like, how, how significant is that improvement that, that could be put towards property taxes? But we know that there, there has been there some included in the budget. Right. And we believe that there's going to be an increase in the purchase of how much that is. 
And is that revenue upgrade, is that related to the Eclipse at all? Uh, hard to say. Um, it's coming from all sources that I don't, I don't believe so. But I still believe it's from uh, For Interim Secretary Saunders, you mentioned previously about um, the equity issues around uh, budgets that aren't yet passed. We're, we're in very uh, districts still looking to pass a budget. Um, can you talk a little bit about your thinking there? How, how are, you know, the for the districts that are yet to pass school budgets, what effects do you see that happening? I think the, the districts that are still um, seeking to pass budgets are certainly concerned about planning for the next academic year. As the governor mentioned, this will be an ongoing dialogue as we explore this variety of options. Um, but as we go to the table and have these discussions, we certainly need to be intentional about how it will affect the impact of rural communities and high poverty communities, and that needs to be at the core of the conversation. From, from talking to school business managers, it sounds like it's it's fairly typical for a district. You know, they get their education payment on April 30th. They wait till September 10th to receive their next education payment. They might take out a line of credit in that interim period to make payroll. Is the AOE um, doing any work with districts without budget to ensure that they can continue to make payroll in those couple of months between education payments when they may uh, not have a budget and, and be struggling for cash flow? So we did recently um, provide some um, guidance to districts and just to clarify how this process will work in terms of those particularly that are struggling to pass a budget. So that guidance did go out and I think that has been quite helpful um, in terms of explaining um, the, the variables that play and what the different scenarios would be. Um, but our, our teams continue to provide you know, technical assistance and answering questions as needed to those districts. And it would still be the districts would seek private funding, right? It's not like a district can get a loan from YED Fund to continue meeting payroll. I have to defer to a team member. Governor, H 687, the Act 250 reform bill is on your desk now. Do you plan to assign a veto it? It's uh, still weighing that all out. As I said before, you have to weigh the good versus the bad. There's a lot of bad in the bill from my perspective. Uh, a few, few pieces of, of good, um, but we're still waiting that all out. Uh, we have until Thursday. Can you just say more specifically what you see as the good parts and the, the bad parts? Well, the whole the housing uh, piece, and uh, you know, you can look at what they want, that's why they put the two together. They put the long range conservation bill in with some housing in hopes that uh, they get it across the finish line. But again, I'm balancing the housing piece, which is the good piece of the portion, um, with a long term conservation piece that will be devastating for the rural Vermont in the coming years. So um, just have to weigh that out to see if uh, you know, the short term gaming is worth it. You know, the debate this session really centered on this NRB study that happened last summer that had this compromise to 
relax Act 250 in already developed areas and strengthen it in you know, sensitive ecosystems? I mean, do you buy that that compromise? Does it satisfy you? Well, again, um, this will affect rural Vermont dramatically. Everything will be under Act 250 and further stagnate the growth so that's why I'm fearful. Like, what is the long-term negative effect? Does that we balance that out with a short-term gain for housing, which we desperately need? Is it worth it? I mean, there's the even in the long term, there are exemptions for housing in cities and towns. Well, some and, of them sunset. Well, some some of them sunset, but then not, there's not a longer-term like plan too. Years. A long time to get the housing uh, that we need. We get worth thousands of units per month. So, you know that 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 will play into this as well. I know the I think in the Senate um, they propose something longer, and then I think in conference committee they will just drop that. So it's only that we use to some of the housing proposals. They, you know, they extended that. Governor, what about the uh, data privacy bill and kids code? Those are kind of together. That's on your desk. Yeah. How do you feel about the private right of action? Well, again, that's a big concern to me. The private right of action. As well, we're receiving an enormous amount of concern from small businesses throughout the state, and that's elevated over the last two or three days. Um, the kids code portion. It's a portion that we've got brought into the bill because that's a good one of the good pieces as well. Uh, but uh, small businesses are very, very concerned. It's for a lot of businesses. What, ki oh, what, what kinds of concerns are, are you here? Across the board. I mean, they, they're all for um, the goal of this bill. Uh, but, they, uh, but they feel as though they're really tying the hands of them. And uh, they would have been. Much, I think they would have been behind a bill like the Connecticut bill uh, that would have, uh, that would have provided the protection they believe that most of all is In fact, in New Hampshire, just uh, they, they, they signed on to the Connecticut bill in your legislature this past So it's unfortunate. We had to go beyond that. In your campaign materials, you talk about um, being a young person, a small business owner, seeking to expand here. You had me fooled. Um, uh, and running into Act 250 troubles, trying to expand your business. How is that like a influential moment in your sort of political awakening? Was it good? Yeah, I wouldn't say so, but it was certainly devastating to me. As someone who was just out of college, you know, got into business and was building a, a shop in Morrisville, I thought I'd come across all the T's and dotted all the I's. And Got through the local and some state. I had no idea what Act 250 was or that I had to apply for it until I was about 90% complete on this building I was building myself. And, um, and, and there was a cease and desist order on Act 250 that shut me down for about a year. And again, that was devastating to me because I had no income and nothing. So it was, uh, yeah, life changing for me at that point. Maybe in some respects, it, uh, it got me to it. move into a different path. I went to work for uh, a construction company that my uncle had owned. And this is history, and I did all right in that area. Uh, anyway. So maybe it was a blessing, who knows? But uh, it was devastating to me at that point. Are you going to see something? Thank you.